Hi, I'm Heather Darch, and this is a presentation by the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network. In this series called Raising Spirits, we are telling the stories of our vanishing heritage. Affordable land and a chance to start anew seem too good to be true. Yet this was the lure that brought many settlers into Quebec's eastern townships from the United States and the British Isles. Through rough cut tracks in the woods, people made their way into unknown territory. Small communities dotted the landscape, usually around the first grist and flour mills. And here they made potash, established schools and churches, cleared the land for farming, and created their own economies from forestry and mining. They tried to survive and thrive. Time has taken its toll on many of these early places. This is Lost Nation. One day, a friend I was talking with said, oh yeah, we were up driving around in Lost Nation, and then, where is this place? And so, uh, I always like driving the back roads. That's kind of my hobby, is to run the back roads and discover new places. So, yeah, I took a drive up in there and was quite captivated with how beautiful it was and how there wasn't a town there. So then, I started digging around in some of the local history books and uh, discovered that there was this once vibrant community. So uh, it captured my imagination. I'm Morris Crossfield. I'm uh, a local history buff. And today we're in Lost Nation. So Lost Nation is uh, just to the east of Knowlton um, and up in the hills a little bit. Back in the early 1800s, uh, the Fuller family moved there, and the Dudleys, and a few others, and initially it was called Pleasant Valley. And you know, it is, when you get a look at this place, it's absolutely gorgeous up there. The area was settled by what some historians would call late loyalists, and they showed up in the early 1800s, after things had calmed down in the States, maybe they looked at how the United States were shaping up and didn't like what they saw. Maybe they came for the free land or the chance to make their fortune. So they were the, the first settlers in the area and that, like I say, early 1800s. Over the years they developed, they had a schoolhouse, they had a couple of blacksmith shops, they had the old Prime Tavern, which was the stop on the St. John's to Stansted stagecoach line. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a happening little town. They had everything except a church. One day, a couple of traveling preachers showed up and they moved into the schoolhouse and they started holding these nighttime revivals and since there wasn't much else to do, everybody went to the revivals. And at the end of every night, the collection plate got passed around. And after a week of this, people were thinking that these guys were charlatans. And they started giving them a hard time, were really quite rude to them, basically ran them out of town. And as legend has it, as the preachers were leaving town, they said, oh, what a lost nation of souls is this. And so that's how Lost Nation became Lost Nation. Back in the year of 1838, in the history of Alton West, there was a little place just round the bed, cutting their way among the wilderness. They were building homes, they were settling. People lived through forestry up there. I mean, it's not really great farmland. It's gravel and trees. And trees were such an integral part of their lives then. Potash making, lumber, firewood, that's all there was. So you lived and died by trees. Well, you can't ask a penny from a poor man without giving him This 
They were mostly, uh, we would say, from like the United Kingdom, They're British, Irish, Scottish. Later years, a few Francophone families moved in, the Bissonettes, and they actually ended up in later years owning the old Prime Tavern, which at that point was a farmhouse. And uh, there was actually a bit of a tale around that because the elder Bissonette was murdered. It turned out it was a neighbor, this was in the 1950s, and they had a party line. And one of the neighbors was listening in on what his neighbors were up to and discovered that the elder Bissonette had money in his house. That became known as the party line murders. And uh, that building also no longer exists. So here we are at the intersection of Fuller Road and Stagecoach. Uh, Stagecoach was the line between Saint-Jean to Stansted, and uh, it's one of the oldest roads in the townships. The idea that stagecoaches and various things went up and down this, it's kind of mind-boggling because it's like big growler rocks from the Ice Age and all kinds of stuff. So. And this would have been the metropolitan downtown core of Lost Nation. According to the maps, there probably would have been 20, 25 houses here at one point in time. But now we're basically down to the occasional home here or there. And yeah, not much else. All the businesses are gone, the schoolhouse, everything. This church began its life as Joseph Fuller's tannery, and I guess when he didn't have a use for it anymore, it was donated uh, to become a, an Anglican church down here in the valley. And the story behind it is that young John Pibus uh, was put in charge of the horses to drive it down here. So it probably was brought down on skids and logs and various things. and. Uh, John Pibus was 14 years old, but was known as having good skill with the horses, as they said. So this young man had to, or got the opportunity to drive a church, which I think is something that should be on everybody's bucket list. It's remained here to this day. Uh, it's no longer active as a church. Uh, it's privately owned, but it is certainly one of the prettiest little churches uh, in this part of the world. We are here at the Fuller Cemetery. Um, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's kind of a forlorn site uh, that's hard to find, uh, but we found it. Uh, there are Gravestones here dating back into the 1820s and 30s. Various families from Lost Nation, children that didn't survive, ancestors of people who still live in the area today, some of them. It's just was neglected for many years. The local historical society has put up a chain link fence. But other than that, someone could walk by it and never even notice it was here. There's probably about 35 or 40 headstones here. Over here, we have the tombstone of Joseph Fuller. He was the first Fuller to come to this part of the world. And he died in 1872 at the ripe old age of 95, which is a pretty amazing accomplishment considering the lives these people lived. and he outlived his wife, Laura. She passed away in 1851. So here we have Levi Cooper, who died in January 11th, 1848. I think that's 87 years. It's hard to read a lot of these tombstones. When they cleaned up the site, they decided to leave them as is because in cleaning them up, they can be ruined and become unreadable. 
Mary Cooper, wife of Levi Cooper, and she died in 1830-something. And it's really hard to read now. Hey, someone left a flower. Nice to see that they still get visited from time to time. Oh, and there's another one here to a little tiny tombstone that isn't marked. It was quite common for children to not survive very long after birth and they would be buried and they wouldn't even have their tombstone engraved. The people up there were quite isolated other than the stagecoach road going through. And at the same time, Paul Hall and Knowlton was building a mill here and really trying to create Knowlton as we know it. And it's funny that those preachers, as the song says, seem to curse the town because in 1840, Lester Ball discovered the Bolton Pass Road. And that was a more direct route coming from Lake Mimfermagog through to Knowlton. So they lost a bunch of traffic going through Lost Nation from that. And then as the years went by, Knowlton got the railroad and just kind of built up to the point where Lost Nation just sort of dwindled away. The children started coming to school in Knowlton. Everything was done in Knowlton. Business was done in Knowlton. And Lost Nation at that point was little more than a collection of houses and lumber camps. So Knowlton became Knowlton and Lost Nation became lost. And now there's practically nothing left to it. You know, I think when we're remembering history, we tend to focus too much on the movers and shakers, the, the big names, the, the grand men of history, you know? And I'm more interested in how farmer Johnson settled his land and just how hard they worked to build something out of nothingness. I mean, the, the Eastern Townships, there were, it was just trees. And so for every acre of land, it, you had to, you know, cut trees and move trees and pull up stumps. And just the amount of work involved is, is mind boggling. It's no wonder that a lot of them died young and there was just no other alternative. So those, those to me feel very real and they feel like they should be remembered for, for what they brought us, that everything we see in you know, this part of the world has been shaped by human hands in one way or another. And the roots wither.